If the local boogeyman came out of retirement and joined forces with a disgruntled auto mechanic to wreak havoc on your community, what would you do? Haddonfield's resident punching bag has finally had enough, and it seems he's found his own Mr. Miyagi in the form of a hulking, psychopathic killing machine of indeterminate supernatural ability. Together, they're fixing to tear this town a new one, starting with basically anyone that's even so much as raised their voices to them in the past. If we want to survive, we'll have to try really hard, not to make the worst decisions imaginable at every possible turn, which seems to be easier said than done around here. I'm gonna break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat Michael Myers in Halloween Ends. Corey is kind of a dork. It's Halloween night, and instead of spending the occasion slugging back shots of apple pie with his fellow 20-somethings, he's boldly volunteered to babysit the Allen family's insufferable offspring over at their lavished four-story home. Boy, that sure is a long way down. I hope the banister is suitably reinforced to prevent any unfortunate accidents. In direct defiance of the client's clear instructions, the two sit down to watch the single greatest horror movie ever created. However, don't go mistaken this little feature for an act of bonding. Junior's clearly the one running the show here. And I don't really feel like pretending to be best friends with an ugly boy babysitter. Charming. Really makes me invested in wanting to keep you alive while your parents are out cooking up a sequel. Seriously though, you're really gonna take that kind of lip from a bedwetter? He's not even half your size. Since the kid's parents told us he's afraid of the dark, a better idea would be to slip out to the garage and shut the power off of the breaker. Then he'd probably do whatever we told him just to keep from getting gobbled up by the monster under the bed. Bonus points if we let him sweat out in the living room for a little bit before we come back. What? It's Halloween. Brutally traumatizing small children is pretty much half the fun. As long as we flip the lights back on by the time his parents come home, they'll probably just write it off as some kind of freak electrical outage. That's assuming they're even coherent enough to understand, much less give a goddamn. Lacking the testicular fortitude to put the fear of God into a nine-year-old, Corey slinks off into the kitchen to drown his frustrations with whatever they got in the fridge. Whoa, a little early for the hard stuff, don't you think? Suddenly, the sound of something falling over draws him back to the other room, where it seems someone came through in a hurry, and Jeremy's nowhere to be found. Great going, Mrs. Dalfire. You suck a babysitter. Gotta go with the good son on this one. You had one job, and you blew it. Kid's probably halfway to Neverland by now. Just then, Corey hears Jeremy calling for help from the top floor. You might want to get a move on before the screaming turns into silence. Then again, we should probably find something to arm ourselves with first. After all, tis the season. And nobody's seen the hometown horror since the time he single-handedly wiped out an angry mob the year before. Oh, never mind. Looks like our hero found himself a bread knife? Starting to lean more towards this all being just a ruse meant to pull one over on the babysitter. Even if the hash-slinging slasher chose to grab something other than the butcher knife from the block, why would he just leave it on the stairs for us to grab on our way up? Besides, you'd think Kiddo would have waited five minutes to start losing his sh after seeing a seven foot tall masked lunatic walk in through the front door. This video is sponsored by Scentbird. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service on a mission to empower you to capitalize on one of humans' most powerful senses. Give people a powerful scent to remember you by. Scentbird lets you choose a new designer fragrance to try every month for just $17. Every month, you get to pick what you want to receive, so there's no surprises. With each fragrance, you'll get a 30 day supply so you can try out fragrances before committing to a full size bottle that can cost hundreds of dollars. This month I received North Atlantic Right Whale Sanctuary. The smell of the ocean as if you're sailing on a luxury yacht. Definitely unique. Vince Camuto Alm Intenso. This is your go-to for dates. Gives off the impression that you're no simple man. You're sophisticated, bold, modern. Whether or not you are is up to you, but that's the impression it will give. Parfum de Marly, Paris Laden. This one is mellow, warm, calming, dare I say sensual. The card says it smells velvety. And I gotta say, it actually does. This is less of a confidence play than Intenso. This is that third date cologne. Scentbird is now delivering these curated colognes in new, well-designed, functional cases. Make sure to use my coupon code NERDEXPLAINS2 to get 55% off your first month at Scentbird. It's just a little over $7 for your first month. Available in the USA and Canada. Thanks Scentbird for sponsoring this video. And check out the links below. Corey's investigation leads him into the attic. And wouldn't you know it, the door slams shut behind him on 
almost as soon as he walks in the room. Oh, and just take a wild guess who was behind this. Kind of makes you wish this was the black phone, doesn't it? However, it seems Jeremy's not the only one who was afraid of the dark. Corey immediately comes unglued at the thought of spending all of 15 minutes alone in an empty attic waiting for the Allens to get home. Speaking of which, here they come now and just in time to watch this happen. What was that? Well, at least we don't have to worry about him ratting us out for letting him watch The Thing. Fortunately, we'll at least have some physical evidence to back up our story in the form of a busted door frame. That said, Jeremy didn't exactly do us any favors by staging that living room struggle along with the knife. If I didn't know better, I'd say the little sicko was deliberately setting us up to take the fall for his own murder. Talk about trick-or-treating. Fast forward to the current year, and things have not been going great for old Corey. It's been four years since everyone's favorite SNL cast member carved up half the town in one of his characteristic spooky season massacres. And since everyone got tired of waiting for their main monster's return, they decided to make a new one out of the local brainchild. Despite ultimately being acquitted of all charges, it seems Corey's morbid reputation precedes him, bringing us to this ugly episode outside the quickie mark. You're that psycho babysitter. He killed that kid, didn't he? Yep. What's the world coming to when a man can't even drink his chocolate milk without getting called a murderer by passing gangs of Zoomers on the street? The ringleader chooses violence, but before the rest can join in to put Corey on ice, local legend Lori shows up to teach them the error of their ways. Nice, just go right ahead and slash the expensive white wall tires on their classic car. It's not like you'll be the very first person they think of the instant they find out. Sure, if this were some massive sprawling metropolis like New York or LA, where there was virtually no chance of you ever running into them again, I'd say knock yourself out. But in a town like this, you're almost certain to cross paths eventually, and there won't always be old ladies around to bail your ass out before they can kick your teeth in. Besides, they know who you are now. It's not unreasonable to think that they might figure out where you live or where you work and ambush you when you least expect it. Also, probably wasn't such a good idea to go squeezing that yoo-hoo to the point it exploded. Not only did it escalate the situation dramatically, you pretty much just cut your love life in half on that piece of broken glass. Lucky for him, Lori's on hand to drive him to the nearby hospital, where it just so happens her granddaughter Allison works as a nurse. The two seem to hit it off almost immediately, and once he's patched up, Corey follows her out to the parking lot for a peek at her undercarriage. You know, cause her muffler's been rattling. With that out of the way, the flirtation resumes. Evidently, last year's bout of Michael Myers' mayhem really did a number on the Hayden Field single scene, as Allison sure doesn't waste any time before asking him out on a date. Yeah, you don't wanna do that. For real, dude sucks with kids. But apparently the women in this family have a thing for matadors. They see a red flag and just go charging right in. The following night, Allison picks Corey up from his mother's house and the pair heads over to a Halloween party at one of the local watering holes. Things start off pretty well, with Corey finally having a chance to show off the killer moves he's been working on while punch dancing out in the forest. However, it isn't long before the young man's checkered past catches up with him. While ordering at the bar, he finds the former Miss Allen at the bottom of a bottle, and it turns out she hasn't quite forgotten about the time he Spartan kicked her precious little hell spawn into an early grave. Seems she doesn't give a damn about what the courts ruled. As far as she's concerned, Corey gave her brat the boot just for the thrill of it. Fortunately, the bartender sees what's going on and reins her in before she can turn the whole crowd against him, but the damage is done. Corey storms out of the bar and hits the road, and despite Allison's pleas for him to shake it off and go back inside, he decides he'd rather spend the rest of the night alone sulking on the sidewalk than with the good-looking lady that's inexplicably attracted to him. Unfortunately, Mrs. Allen isn't the only one around town with an axe to grind. Apparently, that band of degenerates from the convenience store has been cruising around all night looking to properly thank him for the flat tire. Gee, I wonder what tipped them off. However, Corey's in no mood for pleasantries. Whoa, whoa. Hey. You gonna murder us? Same way you killed that kid? Nice work, Zorro. As a general rule, if you're gonna pull a weapon on somebody, you better be willing to use it, or at least hold on to it tight enough that the riffraff can't tap it out of your hands with a single swipe. Although given Corey's well-known track record involving insolent youth, leaving a couple dead teenagers on the side of the road probably wouldn't help him much in the court of public opinion, regardless of whether they might have been asking for it. I know you have a lot of important brooding to do back home in your race car bed, but shoving your way past the first one only to put yourself square in the middle of them was super 
supremely stupid. After all, it wouldn't take a mind reader to know that they were planning to jack you up from the very beginning. Instead, we should have kept all the potential threats in front of us to maximize our options. Then, we could make a run for it if we needed to. Not to mention the fact that we wouldn't have to worry about duking it out in two different directions once things got spicy. By the way, totally neglecting one of these clowns to square up on the other is exactly how you wind up in a rear naked choke. Yeah, just like that. Now would have been a great time to pull out that pocket knife and jab this jerk in the kidneys. You know, if he hadn't already lost it over the side of the bridge. The good news is you're about to get a chance to go look for it, provided you survive the fall. Ah, shit! Is he dead? Go down and look. I guess now he knows how Jeremy feels flat as a pancake. I'm joking, of course. Jeremy can't feel anything, and Corey will probably wish he can't either once he comes to, assuming whoever or whatever is dragging him into this drain pipe doesn't give him the Georgie treatment. The next morning, Corey awakens to find himself alone in a rat-filled sewer. Upon getting his bearings, he heads for the light at the end of the tunnel, only to wind up face-to-face -face with the patron saint of psychos himself. However, instead of snapping his neck like a pencil right there on the spot, Michael Myers uses his recently developed mind link powers to look into Corey Corey's past, and apparently, it's so depressing, he decides to let him go. Dude, imagine being so pathetic, even a mass murderer feels sorry for you. Given a second chance at life, Corey scrambles out of the culverts as fast as he can, just in time to bump into No Bark Noonan out on patrol. The old man takes the opportunity to rave incoherently, before demanding he return to the sewer and deal with the heavily armed chupacabra dwelling within. But Corey's had enough. He grabs old Sticky away from the crackpot and forces it under his ribs, leaving the chosen one spread crawled out under the overpass in a pool of his own fluids. Gotta give Corey props for pulling off the disarm without getting cut to shit. As any YouTuber that's ever touched a mat will tell you, it's pretty much impossible to fend off a knife attack without getting cut. That said, not a big fan of how he chucked that knife away without even trying to wipe off his prints. Sure, it's not like anyone's gonna be filing a missing persons report for this guy, but on the off chance someone happens upon the body, Corey's fingerprints would still be on record. Self-defense or not, if they somehow managed to recover the knife, all it would take is the testimony of the punks that tossed him down there to connect him to the incident and get him locked up. I'm not saying we should report the incident to the cops, but maybe take the knife and body back in the pipe for Michael to play with. At that point, anyone that finds them probably won't be around long enough to make it an issue. After stopping by his house to get cleaned up, Corey heads over to Allison's place to apologize for ditching her at the party. Despite the visible look of horror on her grandmother's face at his sudden changing aura, Allison accepts his apology and agrees to go on a walk with him, which Corey sees is the perfect opportunity to drop this little truth bomb. I killed someone. Jesus, already? Dude's not even cold. Besides, I feel like this is more of a third date conversation. Ah, well, it doesn't matter. Looks like she's totally down for it. With that off his chest, Corey takes Allison to break into the long since abandoned house where his life changed forever. Yeah, it turns out he was only talking about the child he killed. Smart move. Should probably make sure she's a ride or die before letting her know about the latest one. The trauma team spends the rest of the day discussing the incident before sitting down at a local diner to reminisce about the long list of bad memories the town brings to mind. Speaking of which, here comes Allison's wasted ex-boyfriend Doug to make a complete of himself in this family-friendly establishment. Fortunately, in addition to memory swapping and instant laser eye surgery, Michael's super Care Bear stare helped Corey find his big boy voice, which he uses to politely tell this loser to get lost. For once, it seems he might actually be able to resolve a situation without winding up on the ground. Except this isn't over. After dropping Allison off at her house, Corey notices a strange vehicle following him in the distance, prompting him to head back over to the bridge for a good old-fashioned ambush. The mystery machine eventually arrives on the scene, and now walks Doug with mag light in hand. Yeah, I should probably take this time to mention that the dude's one of Haddonfield's finest, meaning he's almost certainly armed. In that case, whatever we do had better be decisive, otherwise we could wind up breathing out of a new hole in our head. Oh, or we could just throw a jacket over his head and hope for the best. Seriously, Corey's lucky all he got was a flashlight to the face. I'll give him points for running the old pie in the windowsill, but we should have used the opportunity to come over the top with something heavy, like a tire iron or a rock. That said, if the plan was always to try and lure him down into the rabbit hole, it would have been a better idea to just stage the light there in the first place. As for Doug, are you seriously gonna get down on your hands and knees to chase a romantic rival through the tunnel of blood? You realize he's probably standing on the other 
side, ready to bash you over the head the second you pop out, right? Just let it go. I get that there aren't all that many fish in this pond, but you gotta believe if this is the kind of guy she's hanging out with now, you probably don't want none of that anymore. Well, apparently the potential shame of re-downloading Hinge is just too much for him to handle because he's doing this. And wouldn't you know it, almost as soon as he gets on his feet, Michael Myers comes out of nowhere and pins him against the wall. But it seems the old slasher's lost his edge. Good thing Corey was there to follow up with a beatdown. Although, he's having trouble closing the deal. Show me how to do it. Just keep doing what you're doing, dude. A few more smacks with that mag light and Doug's a goner. Besides, since when do you have trouble killing people? You didn't even have to try the first time. Let's face it, you're a natural. Inspired to share his craft with the younger generations, Michael retrieves his favorite kitchen knife from its hiding place in the wall and starts doing what he does best. Evidently, it's just like riding a bike, as it only takes a few stabs before he's back at the top of his game. Having renewed his sense of self-worth, he's ready to embark on one last rampage before this worn-out franchise gets shelved for good, and his new partner in crime knows just where to begin. Elsewhere in town, Allison's piece of sh boss, Dr. Mathis, is gearing up for a romantic night with her fair-weather friend and co-worker, Deb. Yeah, take a wild guess who just got a promotion recently. Nurse Ratchet steps away for a moment to freshen up for the main event, when a sudden commotion from outside prompts her to go check on her sugared, I mean, employer. Hey, good on her for not just brushing it off and assuming everything is okay. But if you're really that concerned something might have gone wrong, you should bring your phone with you in case it's an emergency. After all, Dr. Mathis isn't exactly in peak physical condition, so it's probably worth the added precaution, just in case all this excitement's left him stiff as a board. Upon reaching the courtyard of this humble abode, Deb flips the lights on to find the good doctor getting uncorked by Raggedy Andy. Terrified, she retreats back inside the house, just in time to lock Corey outside. But before she can get through to the police, the other half of the equation emerges from a nearby closet for a little redecorating. <laughs> Guess he also has super powered stud finding capabilities. Not sure why the pinup girl would have gone back to play peekaboo with Corey while trying to get the cops on the line. I mean, it's not like she could have known the OG was about to come out of nowhere and stick her to the wall like zebra skin, but even if he hadn't, that sliding glass door was not gonna hold forever. If I were in her shoes, I would have taken the phone deeper into the house and locked myself in wherever I could. Of course, there probably isn't a single room in this place that could hold back a human wrecking ball like Mike, but at least we might be able to warn the town about the copycat killer before they jack torrents their way inside and hacked us to pieces. As we all know, killing is hard work, and because he was kicked out of his mom's place for talking to a girl, Corey decides to sleep off last night's festivities where it all began. Well, for him at least. Yeah, nothing says it was an accident, quite like snoozing away on the dried bloodstain where Jeremy hit the floor, starting to wonder if Mrs. Allen wasn't onto something. This time, he's awakened by the sound of Lori menacingly rocking back and forth in the dining room chair. Apparently, she She's been waiting around for God knows how long so she could wax poetic about the two types of evil before telling him to leave Allison alone. Man, if only you didn't try and hook her up with the first child killer you met, then maybe none of this would have happened. Unfortunately, her speech attempt falls flat, and Corey makes it clear that if he can't have her granddaughter, no one will. However, when he goes to drive his point across with fire poker, it turns out she's already batman her way out of the nearby window. There's a reason this conversation usually involves a shotgun, but at least he wasn't shy about his intentions. It's too bad Lori didn't have the foresight to record this exchange for Allison's benefit. After all, if the kid was really demon-possessed like she thought, then any conversation they were going to have was bound to take a turn for the worse. Of course, this works both ways. Now Corey knows for sure she's onto him. Better start strapping up for when he inevitably shows up at the house to make good on that threat. First things first, having successfully killed all of two and a half men, it seems Corey thinks it's time he wore the mask himself. You know, cause why may maintain the working relationship you have with an unstoppable killing machine that has the power to read minds. He literally just went with you to help sort out your girlfriend's work drama. I'm pretty sure he'd be down to clown on this op as well, especially since it involves settling the score with the one person he's been trying to kill for almost half a century. Also, think for a second. Michael's been wearing that thing for more than four straight years. You know it's gotta smell like hot, sick 
rats in there. Good luck sneaking up on people while you're constantly fighting back the urge to vomit uncontrollably. Having claimed his prize, he sets out to tie up a few loose ends before his final confrontation with the Golden Girl. And who better to start with than the punks that sent him down this dark road to begin with? Corey tracks the kids down to a local service station and leaves his calling card on the hood of their convertible. Once they take the bait, he lures them over to his stepdad's pick and pull to play a little hide and shriek. Hmm, I wonder why he would just wait around for us to spot him after vandalizing our car. It's almost like he wants us to follow him into that creepy abandoned junkyard for some reason. Upon reaching the wrecking yard, the gang decides to exact their revenge on Corey's conspicuously placed motorcycle. But just as they're about to hook it up to the back of their car for a little sidewalk surfing, it seems the iron mullet has fallen asleep at the wheel. Wait, what are you trying to do, man? Suck your own- Oh my god! I guess somebody should have kept an eye out. Suddenly, a nearby tow truck roars to life, which for some reason makes the girls want to jump right into the headlights like a pair of mule deer instead of, say, running in literally any other direction. Do you not see the locked gate topped with barbed wire down there? Unless you're planning to pull vault that thing, there's no way in hell you're gonna make it over the top before that wrecker makes you into road pizza. The fencing surrounding the rest of the perimeter seems to be basically the same height as the gate, and you could probably find an old junker to stand on to make climbing out even easier. Whatever, screw lateral movement, right? Better to just bet the house on our ability to outrun an internal combustion engine. There's a recipe for longevity if I've ever heard one. Oh, and the bright ideas don't stop there. What do you think Stacy does after seeing her friend get mowed down by some maniac in a pickup truck? Did you guess run back towards the still idling vehicle currently occupied by the killer? If so, I probably don't even need to tell you what happens next. Hmm, I wonder what the fearless leader's been up to while his friends were out competing in the Darwin Olympics. Well, in a shocking display of brain function, he decides to run over to the nearby office and beg the owner for help, who immediately dials 911 and reports the incident to the law enforcement. Nah, he actually decides to arm the complete stranger before immediately turning his back on him to go investigate. Jesus Christ, dude. For all you know, this little piece of crap came here to just screw you over. Why else would a bunch of idiot high schoolers be trespassing around your business in the middle of the night? Besides, even if he's telling the truth, what makes you think he's competent enough with a firearm to not put a hole in your head by accident. Yeah, sorry about your friends, dude, but I'm locking the door and calling the cops. Here's a claw hammer in case you don't feel like suffering a slow and painful death at the hands of a chronically single stepson. Old Ronald McDummy makes his way to the busted gate where he finds Margo still alive underneath the wreckage. However, before he can tap into his old man's strength and yeet the truck right off of her, he notices Corey standing quietly in front of the truck. Yeah, you see how your wife's weird kid is holding a creepy Halloween mask next to a bunch of dead and wounded teenagers, you think it's possible he might have had something to do with it. <sighs> Couldn't be. Clearly, this is all some kind of misunderstanding. Evidently, that's what's going through his head because his first reaction upon seeing Terry come out with a rifle is to put himself directly in the line of fire with predictable results. I got it! mind-blowing. Props to him for laying down his life to protect someone he cares about, but it might have been worth asking yourself if this creep is really worth the headache. And Terry, you stupid quit. All you had to do is not call your shot like that, and Ronald would not have had a chance to screw everything up. That said, I wouldn't recommend taking a shot like that in the first place, unless there was an imminent deadly threat. Either way, now you have to find him again. Might be a good time to fall back to the office and call for backup. After all, Corey works here, meaning he knows the layout out of this place. Going in after him is just going to result in you getting ambushed and disarmed. As for Margot, well, it's not looking good. Her only hope of making it out alive is the fire department showing up to cut her out of that mess. And giving Clone High JFK still thinks he can sort this out on his own? Something tells me that's not gonna happen. But hey, at least she'll have one last chance to make a half-decent decision before catching the coup de gras. Let's watch. Stacy! Stacy's dead! You did too! And she blew it. Seriously, what kind of half baked warning was that? You couldn't have just said behind you or look out or something? Even screaming unintelligibly would have been less confusing than that. Your reward for getting cute with the call outs is a front row seat to Terry's acetylene glow up before Corey comes back to stomp a mud hole in your face. With that out of the way, Corey loads up in the tow truck to pay his girlfriend a visit. Along the way, he drops in on a couple honorable mentions, including his own mother and the local radio DJ. Yeah, not much 
check in safe for these folks besides some of the basics like locking your doors, keeping an eye on points of entry, and maybe hiring staff members that will recognize a serial killer when they see one. Seriously, for a town that was supposedly traumatized following a slew of brutal slayings, they sure don't seem to act like it. One would expect folks around here to be a whole lot twitchier, especially around Halloween. Back at Allison's place, it looks like Lori's gearing up to speedrun her golden years. After calling the cops to report a self-deletion in progress, she takes a Ruger LCR from her safe and assumes the position. Meanwhile, Corey arrives at the house just in time to enter the splash zone, only things aren't all they appear to be. Did you really think I'd kill myself? I mean, yeah, kinda. Okay, I get it was meant to be convincing, but did you really have to put a loaded gun to your head with your finger on the trigger? I'm pretty sure he couldn't see that part anyway. So, now that your daughter's boyfriend is bleeding out on the hardwood, this would be a good time to call the cops back and let them know about your insane ruse. That way, they send more than a single unit and an ambulance before the real Slim Shady shows up to finish the job. Actually, never mind. It turns out committing unalive is still on the menu. Brace yourself for this because it's some of the dumbest decision making we've seen on the channel to date. Despite staging an ambush for the express purpose of ending this nightmare once and for all, Lori decides that she actually wants Corey to kill her. No, seriously. She even empties the last two shots in her revolver before walking into stabbing distance and literally telling him to do it. What the heck was the purpose of all that then? Sure, I guess she could be thinking he'll bleed to death after doing the deed or maybe wind up getting hauled off to a mental hospital, but A, you don't know that his wounds are fatal, and B, if he does get locked up, he could wind up getting released decades later, just like the real Michael Myers. You'd literally just be starting this cycle all over again. However, instead of giving her the satisfaction of being brutally murdered in her own home, Corey decides that two can play at this game. If I can have her. Boom. Checkmate Granny, but she's not about to give up that easily. In a desperate bid to make her intentions even less comprehensible, Lori rips the knife out of Corey's neck, thereby completely ensuring he'll bleed to death in a matter of seconds. Oh, and just in time for Allison to walk in the door and tragically misread the situation. It's bad enough the cops are gonna think you ruthlessly executed a home invader with his own weapon, now your grandkid is gonna go on thinking you murdered her boyfriend, which you sorta just did. Before Lori can even attempt to explain explain away the absolute screw party that just unfolded in this madhouse, Allison storms off into the rain to ugly cry back in her car. Just think, all of this could have been avoided had you just minded your own business back at the gas station. It's not over yet though, cause OJ just showed up to get his back. Also, it seems Corey still has a little life left in him. Oh well, not anymore. For a second there, I thought for sure our main character's actions might come with permanent moral consequences. Thank God Michael got here just when he did. Hearing his characteristic wheezing, Lori locks the house down in anticipation of her final showdown with the very man who's haunted her dreams for decades. Bet you wish you didn't dump those last two shots in the sheetrock now, don't ya? Also, what's with the wheel guns in this town? There was this crazy new invention back in 1891 called the semi-automatic pistol. Maybe look into it. 17 shots of 9mm beats 5 shots of 357 mag any day of the god week. Whatever, who needs guns when you have craft dinner? <laughs> Gotta admit, that was a solid use of a distraction, although it might have been a good idea to follow up the disarm by dosing him in the eyes with a fire extinguisher. Depending on what kind it was, the chemicals could blind him long enough for us to gain the upper hand. Unfortunately, Lori's firefighting skills are no match for Michael's brute strength, but instead of just snapping her neck and getting it over with like he did with Corey, he decides to... <sighs> just sort of throw her around for a while until she's finally able to pin him down. I guess we're meant to believe that Michael Myers, THE Michael Myers, who's been shot, stabbed, set on fire, has single-handedly fought off an angry mob, and somehow spent the last four years subsiding on rat carcasses in a storm sewer, was defeated in single combat by a frail old woman. Sounds right to me. Now let's see who this guy really is. Bigfoot! You're just a man who's about to stop breathing. 
Savage. Oh, but throat cut or not, you know he's got to lash out for one last strangling before the end. Fortunately, it seems Allison forgot her purse. Otherwise, this might have ended in a draw, proving that when seconds count, cops will always be minutes away. The boys in blue finally roll in to take a statement. However, it seems this one won't be played out by the book. No, instead, they're going to gather up the townsfolk for a good old-fashioned corpse parade. This is not how it works. It is tonight. After tying his body to the roof of a car like a whitetail, the procession makes its way to the local waste management facility. Once there, they finally lay their collective fears to rest in the most definitive way imaginable by feeding his body to the sewage grinder. In the end, both Michael and his disciple were taken out before they could settle the score with Lori, although they still managed to trim down the census a bit before that happened. That said, had Corey taken our advice from the get-go, he could have avoided falling into Michael's clutches in the first place, thus preventing the series of events that led to all the mayhem. For that reason, I think Halloween Ends was beaten. Moral of the story, who needs justice when you have the Muffin Monster? Don't forget to use my code NerdExplains2 to get 55% off your first month at Senfer.